We hear a lot of talk these days about thought leaders, but nowhere near enough about heart leaders. We need leaders who challenge us, both in the things they say and in the ways they carry themselves in the world, to be more compassionate and empathic, to live with our hearts open, to be present to people in the most vulnerable moments of their lives. Cultivating compassion and empathy is at the very heart of Judaism's vision of the spiritual life. To take Judaism seriously is to commit to growing kinder, to showing up and being present with people during moments of pain and suffering. This is what Judaism calls walking in God's ways, or chesed, a life of love and kindness. A Midrash teaches, as God is called merciful, so should you be merciful. As the Blessed Holy One is called gracious, so should you be gracious. As God is called righteous, so you too should be righteous. And the Talmud adds, as God clothes the naked, so you too clothe the naked. The Blessed Holy One visited the sick, so you too visit the sick. The Blessed Holy One comforted mourners, so you too comfort mourners. The Blessed Holy One buried the dead, so you too bury the dead. Taken together, these two sources provide a remarkable window into Judaism's vision of the good life. Judaism asks us for the integration of the inner and the outer, of emotion and action, of character and conduct, of caring and doing. They also give the lie to one of the most persistent and enduring caricatures of the Jewish tradition, namely, that Judaism only cares about what we do, but not about what we feel or about who we are. But Judaism demands both. Judaism asks us both to care deeply about the widow and the orphan, about the ill and the grieving, about the lonely and abandoned, and to act concretely to help ameliorate their suffering. There is one grain of truth in this caricature of Judaism, and in fact, it's not really a grain of truth at all. Given the choice between someone who cares but does not act and someone who acts but does not care, every Jewish thinker everywhere will choose the person who does not care but acts. Because in Jewish ethics, the most important thing in the world, the most urgent thing in the world, is the concrete need of the person in front of me. So Judaism will always choose the circumstance where the sick are visited and the hungry are fed. But just to be clear, that's like saying, given the choice between bad and worse, Judaism chooses the bad and concluding from that, that lo and behold, Judaism treasures the bad. Well, yes, but only in comparison with the worst. Judaism's ideal, in any case, remains clear at all times. The full integration of my heart and my hand, of caring and acting in this world tangibly and concretely to help people in pain. Now, if you look closely for a minute at this list, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, comforting the mourners, burying the dead, you'll see something striking. Some of us, no doubt, are frightened by all of these situations. And all of us, I suspect, at least some of the time, are frightened by some of them. Overwhelmed by fear, we are tempted to run away. Judaism comes along and says, if you want to be religious, if you want to serve God, if you want to be an heir of the Jewish tradition, learn to run towards the very places you are tempted to run away from. Learn to see those others look past. That is what Judaism asks of us. Fear is very hard. We have to push ourselves and be kind to ourselves at the very same time. Let me give you a concrete example of what I mean, speaking very personally. 
For many years now, I've been visiting Alzheimer's patients with students from Mahon Hadar. Sometimes those visits are rewarding. Sometimes they're even inspiring. But in all honesty, they're often just very hard, and sometimes they're actually terrifying. I cannot tell you how many times I have stood at the entrance of a dementia patient's room and felt overcome with fear and anxiety. Fear. Could this happen to me? Will this happen to me? Will it happen to my wife? Will it happen to my children? Will it happen to everyone I know and care about? And anxiety. Does this room make a mockery of everything I hold most dear? Can I really talk about God in a world so utterly filled with degradation? Can I really say that human dignity is the most important thing in a world, in a world filled with so much heartbreaking sorrow? All I want to do in those moments is run away. And yet Judaism says something at once comforting and overwhelmingly challenging. If you want to grow in spirit, you have to learn to sit with your fears rather than be governed by them. There is no other way because at the end of the day, that's what goodness and kindness require. Now let me emphasize, this is not an idiosyncratic or selective reading of the Jewish tradition. Being present with people in moments of pain is what the sages call walking in God's ways. What countless Jewish philosophers insist is the highest level we can achieve in this life. This is godliness. To take Judaism seriously is to grow in compassion. To refuse compassion is to refuse Judaism. No matter how externally Jewish or mitzvah observant I might appear to be. Now, Many of us can probably imagine what taking this seriously might look like in our own lives. And yet I'd like to ask, what would it mean for us as a community, as a people, to take this challenge to heart? Jewish schools should see it as core to their mandate to teach children to care, to teach children to run towards hospitals and homeless shelters rather than away from them. Jewish children should be taught, and their teachers have to believe this, that visiting the sick or feeding the hungry is not an extracurricular activity, something we do the bare minimum of so we can get back to what really matters to us, like science or Talmud or basketball or yearbook or whatever. No, this is the heart of a Jewish education. Let me put this as bluntly as I can. No chesed, no love and kindness, no Judaism. No chesed, and what we have are schools for Jews, but not yet Jewish schools. A concrete example. Third graders at Carmel Academy in Connecticut spend three weeks each year learning reading, math, and kindness all at the same time. For these three weeks, kids are asked to read to their parents at night. And for every book they read to their parents, they receive a dollar. And when the three weeks are up, they come together and they work on addition. They learn to add by fives and tens and twenty-fives. And when they have pooled all their money and learned how to add it, they go to a toy store and they pick out toys that they can afford as a class that they themselves would want. But here's the catch. They then take those toys and give them to kids whose parents can't afford them. That is not chesed as an extracurricular activity. That is chesed as an ethos, as a way of life. That's a school that teaches kids the joy of learning and the joy of giving at the very same time. That's a Jewish school. Jewish kids need to be taught, both implicitly and explicitly, and in order for them to be taught this, their parents need to be taught it first. How much kindness you do, how much chesed you bring into the world is so much more important than how you do on your SATs and whether or not you end up at an Ivy League school. Kids need to be taught it. 
But first, their parents need to learn it. Now, what I'm asking for here is actually very direct and concrete. Heads of schools should convene conversations with parents, with teachers, and where appropriate with the students themselves, and ask, are we instilling a commitment to kindness, both cognitively and emotionally, in every kid we interact with? Do students see and experience chesed as integral to everything they do and everything they are? Do their parents believe it? Do their teachers believe it in their minds and in their bellies? Could we create an alternative tuition system where parents are asked to pay not just in dollars, but also in hours of community service so that a school becomes truly a center of compassion and kindness and goodness? Maybe they could even ask the hardest question of all, do we have the courage to take this Torah, the Torah, to heart? We as a community need to radically reevaluate what we mean by success. It is perfectly fine to be committed to conventional American measures of success. So sure, be proud of your kid for being a doctor or a lawyer or a management consultant or whatever but be prouder of the fact that your kid takes the time each week to visit a homebound elderly woman, or to cook dinner for the homeless, or to help a struggling child learn to read or relate. When our friends ask us, what are your kids doing these days? Let's not immediately revert to talking about careers or professional milestones. Let's talk about the kindness our kids do. Let's talk about the ways they bring light into some of the darkest places in the world. Let's talk Jewishly. My dream is actually very simple. People should look at synagogues, at community centers, at Hillel houses, and they should be moved to say, it is simply startling how much kindness these people do. Two final thoughts. What Judaism asks for, what life calls for, is not pity, but compassion. Pity is a vertical posture. Compassion is a horizontal one. When I pity someone, I reach down to them, harboring the illusion all the while that I am above them, that what has happened to them could never happen to me. Compassion is totally different. When I manifest compassion in the world, I reach across to someone, knowing full well that by dint of our shared humanity, I and they are both utterly fragile and vulnerable. Judaism tells us that in order to grow in love, we have to embrace our vulnerability rather than seeking a bypass around it. We live in a world so suffused with pain and suffering that talking about God can seem impossibly Pollyanna and naive. We earn the right to talk about God. We serve God best by manifesting now the love and goodness we associate with God. That, at the end of the day, is the most authentic form of worship. I serve God by manifesting the love I insist against all evidence to the contrary. That's who God is, and that's what God wants this world to look like. I serve God by doing that now. You don't need a graduate degree to be a heart leader. You only need a heart and a willingness to open it. So may it be, both for us and for our children. Thank you. Thanks for watching Eli Talks. Click through or subscribe to the Eli Talks channel for more inspired Jewish ideas.